Hello cave dwellers and welcome back to our Trash to Treasure 486 series where piece by piece we turn this dumpster find PC into my ultimate early 90s 486 gaming PC. Today we're running Transport Tycoon Deluxe on it, one of many classics I've been enjoying which also takes advantage of some of the upgrades we've made so far. Those upgrades include replacing the hard drive with a compact flash alternative, a new sound card and a Roland SC88 sound canvas device. So where next for our humble 486? What were our dream upgrades in the early 90s? And what did we need to play the latest and greatest games? Well there's one essential upgrade we haven't mentioned so far, and don't worry I'm not going to make the whole episode about it. Of course we need a mouse, and what better than mouse by Mouse Systems. Our new serial mouse is plug and play, high resolution and can be used left or right handed thanks to those stunning ergonomics as you can see. Let's not dwell on the mouse, we have one, it's installed. What next? Well there's one word that I haven't used so far in this series and it was the biggest marketing buzzword of the early 90s. It was driving a new format and a new way of gaming and that word was multimedia. The word was used to drive the new CD-ROM format and promised us a world of high capacity full motion video based games. So let's join that world with our own CD-ROM drive. I've chosen this IDE Sony model and it's actually a lot newer than the PC. My reasoning for that is we all have great memories of CD-ROM based games, we don't have great memories of single or dual speed CD-ROM drives. And that generally is where our multimedia experiences started and ended in the early 90s. A sound card and a CD-ROM drive. But this is the ultimate 486 build, so we're going big. Really big. Really, really big with this full length 16-bit ISA card. And what is it? It's a Real Magic CD, one of the first MPEG decoding cards. Its sole purpose is to present silky smooth 30 frame per second digital video. And just like those Roland sound devices, it was way out of my price range when it was released, at around $500. So those are today's components, and I can't wait to get them fitted. That CD-ROM drive then is the Sony CDU5215. It's a 52 speed CD-ROM drive and it was produced in 2005, by which time CD-ROM drives cost next to nothing, even CD writers. I remember paying around £300 for a CD writer in 1994. By 2005 that would cost you maybe £25 or 30 US dollars. To fit it we'll need to use a new cable to allow two devices on one channel and we'll have to address the problem we found in episode 1 of our ATA port used to connect the hard drives having one more pin than the cable. Let's use our mouse by Mouse Systems to shut down a Transport Tycoon and uh, we'll get into the box to fit the CD drive. For many people the first CD drive that we used was perhaps at school with something like an Acorn Archimedes or a similar computer, maybe an Apple Macintosh. I think the first drive I actually owned was an A520 which was an add-on for an Amiga 500 to turn it into a CD TV and it was shortly after the failure of CD TV to take off and the signs of Commodore's collapse that I jumped over to the PC platform. Just in time for those early CD based games, I think uh, Day of the Tentacle was one of the first I had and definitely one I'll be revisiting once we get this working. So here's our existing IDE cable which you'll remember just has one end so there's no capacity for an additional device on that single ATA channel that we have on the IO card. So this cable comes out and we replace it with a new one. Here's that new cable which allows us to plug two devices in so while offering us a solution it also comes with two problems. One is that blanked off key pin which we need to address and the other is that it's simply too short to reach both the compact flash card at the back and then through to the CD-ROM drive in the five and a quarter inch drive bays. On our new cable here you can clearly see that blanked off pin and it's preventing us from fitting the cable to our I.O. card as there's actually a pin there. It's a pin that's not used and it's safe to drill it out, a technique confirmed by YouTube commenter Andrew Littleboy who said he's done this himself and it worked fine so thank you Andrew for confirming that. I do also though need to extend the cable so that it reaches the CD-ROM drive so I'm going to tackle both those problems in one go by using these small extension cables. 
The extension cable obviously gives us the additional length we need, but I can simply cut a notch out of the side and using a pair of pliers pull that additional pin out to allow me to slot the cable in. If I wasn't extending the cable I would have simply used the drilling method, but this just seemed like a good solution. I repeated the method so that the cable actually has two extensions fitted to it, and then we plug it into our IO card at one end, through to the existing compact flash card reader there, and then we channel the remainder of the cable and the additional extension through to the CD-ROM where now we have plenty of cable left to position the CD-ROM drive however we want to in those drive bays. So that's our cable sorted, on to, well, yet another problem I'm afraid. Ordinarily we'd just pick what slot we want to put the CD drive in, slide it in and screw it into the chassis from the side. But this case, like many from the period, has custom rails that you have to first screw onto the side of your um, add-on drives and then that allows you to just slot it in and out of the case. You can see them fitted on the side of the floppy disk drive here, and unfortunately there are no spare rails in the case. In our final episode, when I clean up the case and just finish everything up, I'll dremel some holes in the side there to allow me to screw the CD-ROM drive into the case, but for now we'll just rest it in the case and um, well, just make sure it works before we make any permanent cosmetic changes to the case with a dremel. With the drive in place it now needs power so we'll plug a 4 pin Molex connector in there. We also need to remember that as we're running two devices on this cable, one needs to be set to the master device and the other to the slave, so we'll set the CD-ROM drive to the slave device. Not something that we have to consider these days on modern PCs, where we have one cable per device in the example of a SATA cable, and increasingly common now things like the M2 port and other solutions for solid state devices which require no cable whatsoever. No doubt the art of the master, slave and cable select jumper will be lost to time. Last but not least of course the IDE cable plugs in, and that's it our CD-ROM drive is all connected up and ready for testing. Older PCs, certainly those that predated CD-ROM drives like 386s, tend not to show the CD-ROM drive in the BIOS. Some of them don't even support CD-ROM drives without an additional controller card or more often than not a sound card with an additional port for a CD-ROM drive. I remember Creative Labs used to sell a, um, a CD Blaster package which was their Sound Blaster card and a Creative CD-ROM drive in the same box, which was one way to um, get onto the multimedia bandwagon. As expected the BIOS here doesn't detect the CD-ROM drive. So I'm going to boot from a Windows 98 boot disk which includes CD-ROM drivers and if it's successful then we'll just copy those drivers onto the C drive and incorporate them into my own auto exec and config sys so they load up every time we boot. This menu may bring back some memories. Ok the first sign is positive, it loads the Oak Technology CD-ROM driver and it says number of drives detected 1 so we're off to a good start. The next step is to load MSCDEX from the auto exec file which should use this CD-ROM driver and assign the CD-ROM a drive letter, which it does. I think we're nearly there. Let's pop a CD in and see if we can read it. Manhole, incidentally, was the first ever CD-ROM game. Not on the PC, it was released on the Apple Mac and then re-released a few years later on the PC. Sure enough, we can read the contents of the CD, so our CD-ROM drive is officially working. Woohoo! <laughs> Manhole incidentally was created by Rand and Robin Miller as well as Bill Volk. The Millers went on to create the incredibly successful Mist series while Bill Volk went on to create Return to Zork, of which there's a real magic version we'll be checking out later. So that's the CD-ROM drive in place and working. At this point I'd normally demonstrate some CD-ROM games to show it off. I'm sure you, like me, are very keen to see this MPEG card fitted, and as those games are CD-ROM based, we'll be testing the CD drive at the same time. But as we're just hitting the 10 minute mark on this video, I'm going to end the video here, grab yourself a cuppa, and then join me in the next episode where we fit the card. See you in a moment cave dwellers.